Introduction to Lyrical Ballads, 1798. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Advertisement. It is the honourable characteristic of poetry that its materials are to be found in every subject which can interest the human mind. The evidence of this fact is to be sought not in the writings of critics, but in those of poets themselves. The majority of the following poems are to be considered as experiments. They were written chiefly with a view to ascertain how far the language of conversation in the middle and lower classes of society is adapted to the purposes of poetic pleasure. Readers accustomed to the gaudiness and inane phraseology of many modern writers, if they persist in reading this book to its conclusion, will perhaps frequently have to struggle with feelings of strangeness and awkwardness. They will look round for poetry, and will be induced to inquire by what species of courtesy these attempts can be permitted to assume that title. It is desirable that such readers, for their own sakes, should not suffer the solitary word poetry, a word of very disputed meaning, to stand in the way of their gratification, but that, while they are perusing this book, they should ask themselves if it contains a natural delineation of human passions, human characters, and human incidents, and if the answer be favourable to the author's wishes, they should consent to be pleased in spite of that most dreadful enemy to our pleasures, our own pre-established codes of decision. Readers of superior judgment may disprove of the style in which many of these pieces are executed. It must be expected that many lines and phrases will not exactly suit their tastes. It will perhaps appear to them that, wishing to avoid the prevalent fault of the day, the author has sometimes descended too low, and that many of his expressions are too familiar and not of sufficient dignity. It is apprehended that the more conversant the reader is with our elder writers, and with those in modern times who have been the most successful in painting manners and passions, the fewer complaints of this kind will he have to make. An accurate taste in poetry, and in all the other arts, Sir Joshua Reynolds has observed, is an acquired talent, which can only be produced by severe thought, and a long continued intercourse with the best models of composition this is mentioned not with so ridiculous purposes to prevent the most inexperienced reader from judging for himself but merely to temper the rashness of decision and to suggest that if poetry be a subject on which much time has not been bestowed the judgment may be erroneous and that in many cases it necessarily will be so the tale of goody blake and harry gill is founded on a well authenticated fact which happened in warwickshire of the other poems in this collection it may be proper to say that they are either absolute inventions of the author or facts which took place within his personal observation or that of his friends the poem of the thorn as the reader will soon discover is not supposed to be spoken in the author's own person the character of the loquacious narrator will sufficiently shew itself in the course of the story the rhyme of the ancient mariner was professedly written in imitation of the style as well as of the spirit of the elder poets but with a few exceptions the author believes that the language adopted in it has been equally intelligible for these three last centuries the lines entitled expulsion and reply and those which follow arose out of conversation with a friend who was somewhat unreasonably attached to modern books of moral philosophy end of advertisement recording by verity kendall Chapter One of Lyrical Ballads, 1798. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Chapter One: The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in Seven Parts. Arguments. How a ship, having passed the line, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole, and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. Part 1. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three, by thy long grey beard and thy glittering eye, now wherefore stoppeth me? the bridegroom's doors are opened wide and i am next of kin the guests are met the feast is set mayst hear the merry din but still he holds the wedding guest there was a ship quoth he nay if thou'st got a laughsome tail mariner come with me he holds him with his skinny hand quoth he there was a ship now get thee hence thou greybeard loon or my staff shall make thee skip he holds him with his glittering eye the wedding guest stood still 
and listens like a three years child the mariner hath his will the wedding guest sate on a stone he cannot choose but hear and thus spake on that ancient man the bright-eyed mariner the ship was cheered the harbour cleared merrily did we drop below the kirk below the hill below the lighthouse top the sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon the wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bassoon the bride hath paced into the hall red as a rose is she nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy the wedding guest he beat his breast yet he cannot choose but hear and thus spake on that ancient man the bright-eyed mariner listen stranger storm and wind a wind and tempest strong for days and weeks it played us freaks like chaff we drove along listen stranger mist and snow and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald and throw the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen ne shapes of men ne beasts we ken and ice was all between the ice was here the ice was there and the ice was all around it cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises of a swound at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came and an it were a christian soul we hailed it in god's name the mariners gave it biscuit worms and round and round it flew the ice did split with a thunder fit and helmsman steered us through and good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow and every day for food or play came to the mariners hollow in mist or cloud on mast or shroud it perched for vespers nine whiles all the night throw fog smoke white glimmered the white moonshine god save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague thee thus why look thou so with my crossbow i shot the albatross part two the sun came up upon the right out of the sea came he and broad as a weft upon the left went down into the sea and the good south wind still blew behind but no sweet bird did follow ne any day for food nor play came to the mariner's hollow and i had done an hellish thing and it would work and woe for all averred i had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow ne dim ne red like god's own head the glorious sun uprist then all averred i had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist twas right said they such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist the breezes blew the white foam flew the furrow flowed free we were the first that ever burst into that silent sea down dropped the breeze the sails dropped down twas sad as sad could be and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea all in a hot and coppery sky the bloody sun at noon right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon day after day day after day we stuck knee breath knee motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean water water everywhere and all the boards did shrink water water everywhere nay any drop to drink the very deeps did rot o oh christ that ever this should be yea slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea about about in reel and rout the death fires danced at night the water like a witch's oils burnt green and blue and white and some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow and every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root we could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot ah well a day what evil looks had i come from old and young instead of the cross the albatross about my neck was hung part three i saw a something in the sky no bigger than my fist at first it seemed a little speck and then it seemed a mist it moved and moved and took at last a certain shape i wist a speck a mist a shape i wist and still it neared and neared and an it dodged a water sprite it plunged and tacked and veered with throat unslacked with black lips back ne could we laugh ne wail then while through drought all dumb they stood i bit my arm and sucked the blood and cried a sail a sail with throat unslacked with black lips backed agape they heard me call gramercy they for joy did grin and all at once their breath drew in as they were drinking all she doth not tack from side to side hither to work us wheel without and wind without and tide she steadies with upright keel the western wave was all aflame the day was well nigh done almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun when strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun and straight the sun was flecked with bars heaven's mother send us grace as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face alas thought i my heart beat loud how fast she nares and nares are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers are these her naked ribs which flecked the sun did behind them peer and are these two all all the crew that woman and her fleshless fear 
His bones were black with many a crack, All black and bare, I ween, Jet black and bare, save where with rust Of mouldy damps and charnel crust They patched with purple and green. Her lips are red, her looks are free, Her locks are yellow as gold, Her skin is as white as leprosy, And she is far like a death than he, Her flesh makes the still air cold. The naked hulk alongside came, And the twain were playing dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, Quoth she, and whistled thrice. A gust of wind set up behind, And whistled through his bones, Through the holes of his eyes and the hole of his mouth, Half whistles and half groans. With never a whisper in the sea, Off darts the spectre ship, While clomb above the eastern bar, The horned moon with one bright star, Almost between the tips. One after one by the horned moon, Listen, no stranger to me, Each turned his face with a ghastly pang, And cursed me with his e. Four times fifty living men, With never a sigh or groan, With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, They dropped down one by one. Their souls did from their bodies fly, They fled to bliss or woe, And every soul it passed me by Like the whiz of my crossbow. Part four. I fear thee, ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, And thou art long and lank and brown, As is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, And thy skinny hand so brown, Fear not, fear not, thou wedding gift, This body dropped not down. Alone, alone, all, all alone, Alone on the wide, wide sea, and Christ would take no pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a million million slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the eldritch deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven, and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them closed till the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, ne rot, ne reek did they, the look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more terrible than that was the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like morning frosts she spread, and where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt away, a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared the elfish light, fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ships I watched their rich attire, blue and glossy green and velvet black they coiled and swam and every track was a flash of golden fire o oh, happy living things no tongue their beauty might declare a spring of love gushed from my heart and i blessed them unaware sure my kind saints took pity on me and i blessed them unaware the selfsame moment i could pray and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea part five o oh, sleep it is a gentle thing Beloved from pole to pole, to Mary Queen the praise be even, she sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments were all dank, sure I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved and could not feel my limbs, I was so light almost. I thought that I had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost. The roaring wind, it roared far off, it did not come anear, but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. The upper air bursts into life, and a hundred fire-flags sheen. To and fro they hurried about, and to and fro and in and out the stars danced on between. The coming wind doth roar more loud, the sails do sigh like sedge. The rain pours down from one black cloud, and the moon is at its edge. Hark, hark, the thick black cloud is cleft, and the moon is at its side. Like water shone from some high crag, and the lightning falls with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The strong wind reached the ship, it roared and dropped down like a stone. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, ne spake, ne moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all gan work the rope where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools, we were a ghastly crew. 
The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said naught to me, and I quaked to think of my own voice how frightful it would be. The daylight dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. So the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky, I heard the lavrock sing. Sometimes all the little birds that are, how they seemed to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute. And now it is an angel's song that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased, yet still the sails made on, a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like a hidden brook in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Listen, oh, listen, thou wedding guest, Mariner, thou hast thy will, for that which comes out of thine eye doth make my body and soul to be still. Never sadder tale was told to a man of woman born, sadder and wiser thou wedding guest, thou'lt rise to-morrow morn. Never sad a tale was heard by man of woman born. The mariners all returned to work as silent as before. The mariners all gan pull the ropes, but look at me they knolled. Thought I, I am as thin as air, they cannot me behold. Till moon we silently sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, moved onwards from beneath. Under the keel nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun right up above the mast had fixed her to the ocean, but in a minute she gan stir with a short, uneasy motion, backwards and forwards half her length with a short, uneasy motion. Then, like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell into a swound. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard, and in my soul discerned, two voices in the air. Is it he, quoth one, is this the man, by him who died on the cross? With his full bow he laid full low the harmless albatross. The spirit who biddeth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honey do. Quoth he, the man hath penance done, and penance more will do. Part six. First voice. But tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes the ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Second voice. Still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast. His great bright eye, mostly silently, upon the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim. See, brother, see how graciously she looketh down on him. First voice. But why drives on that ship so fast without an wave or wind? Second voice, the air is cut away before and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or shall we be delated? For slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. I woke, and we were sailing so, as in a gentler weather. Twas night, calm night, the moon was high, the dead men stood together. All stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter. All fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. The pang, the curse with which they died, had never passed away. I could not draw my e'en from theirs, and they turned them up to pray. And in its time the spell was snapped, and I could move my e'en. I looked far forth, but little saw of what might else be seen. Like one that on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed a wind on me, and he sound and emotion made. Its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek, like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly on. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. O oh, dream of joy, is this indeed a lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill, is this the kirk, is this mine own country? We drifted o'er the harbour bay, and I with sobs did pray. Oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep alway. The harbour bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay and the shadow of the moon. The moon bay was white or lower, till rising from the same, full many shapes that shadows were, like as of torches came. A little distance from the prow those dark red shadows were, but soon I saw that my own flesh was red as in a glare. I turned my head in fear or dread, and by the holy rood, the bodies that had advanced and now before the mast they stood.
They lifted up their stiff right arm, They held them straight and tight, And each right arm burned like a torch, A torch that's borne upright. Their stony eyeballs glittered on In the red and smoky light. I prayed and turned my head away, Forth looking as for. There were no breezes upon the bay, No wave against the shore. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less, That stands above the rock. The moonlight steeped in silentness The steady weather cock. And the bay was white with silent light, Till rising from the same, Full many shapes that shadows were In crimson colours came. A little distance from the prow Those crimson shadows were. I turned my eyes upon the deck, O Christ, what saw I there? Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat, And by the holy rood, A man all light, a seraph man, On every course there stood. This seraph band each waved his hand, It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, Each one a lovely light. The seraph band each waved his hand, No voice did they impart, No voice but oh the silence sank Like music on my heart. F sons I heard the dash of oars, I heard the pilot's cheer, My head was turned perforce away, And I saw a boat appear. Then vanished all the lovely light, The bodies rose anew, With silent pace each to his place Came back the ghastly crew, The wind that shade nor motion made, On me alone it blew. The pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast, Dear Lord in heaven it was a joy, The dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice, It is the hermit good, He singeth loud his godly hymns That he makes in the wood, He'll shrieve my soul, He'll wash away the albatross's blood. Part 7 This hermit good lives in the wood, Which slopes down to the sea, How loudly his sweet voice he rears, He loves to talk with mariners That come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve, He hath a cushion plump, It is the moth that wholly hides The rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk, Why this is strange, I trow, Where are those lights so many and fair, That signal made but now? Strange by my faith, the hermit said, And they answered not our cheer, The planks that walked, and see those sails, How thin they are and sear, I never saw aught like them, Unless perchance it were, The skeletons of leaves that lag, my forest brook along when the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young dear lord it has a fiendish look the pilot made reply i am a feared push on push on said the hermit cheerily the boat came closer to the ship but i ne spake ne stirred the boat came close beneath the ship and straight a sound was heard under the water it rumbled on still louder and more dread it reached the ship it split the bay the ship went down like lead Stunned by the loud and dreadful sound Which sky and ocean smote, Like one that hath been seven days drowned, My body lay afloat, But swift as dreams myself I found Within the pilot's boat. Upon the whirl where sank the ship, The boat spun round and round, And all was still save the hill Was telling of the sound. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked, And fell down in a fit, The holy hermit raised his eyes And prayed where he did sit. I took the oars, the pilot's boy, Who now doth crazy go, Laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha ha, quoth he, all plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely could he stand. O oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man, the hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner man art thou? Forth with this frame of mine was wretched, with woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, now oft times and now fewer, that anguish comes and makes me tell my ghastly aventure. I pass like night from land to land, I have strange power of speech. The moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me, to him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from the door, the wedding guests are there, but in the garden bow the bride and the bridesmaids singing are, and hark the little vesper bell which biddeth me to prayer. O wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea, so lonely twas that God Himself scarce seemed there to be. O sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with goodly company, to walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth, he made and loveth all. The mariner, whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone, and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned, and is of sense forlorn. 
a sadder and a wiser man he rose the morrow morn end of the rhyme of the ancient mariner recording by verity kendall chapter two of lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by verity kendall lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight by samuel taylor coleridge and william wordsworth the foster mother's tale a dramatic fragment foster mother i never saw the man whom you describe maria tis strange he spake of you familiarly as mine and albert's common foster mother foster mother now blessings on the man whoe'er he be that joined your names with mine o oh, my sweet lady as often as i think of those dear times when you two little ones would stand at eve on each side of my chair and make me learn all you had learnt in the day and how to talk in gentle phrase then bid me sing to you tis more like heaven to come than what has been Maria. Oh, my dear mother this strange man has left me troubled with wilder fancies than the moon breeds in the love-sick maid who gazes at it till lost in inward vision with wet eye she gazes idly but that entrance mother foster mother can no one hear it is a perilous tale maria no one foster mother my husband's father told it me poor old leone angels rest his soul he was a woodman and could fell and saw with lusty arm you know that huge round beam which props the hanging wall of the old chapel beneath that tree while yet it was a tree he found a baby wrapped in mosses lined with thistle beards and such small locks of wool as hang on brambles well he brought him home and reared him at the then lord velez's cost and so the babe grew up a pretty boy a pretty boy but most unteachable and never learned a prayer nor told a bead but knew the names of birds and mocked their notes and whistled as if he were a bird himself and all autumn twas his only play to get the seeds of wild flowers and to plant them with earth and water on the stumps of trees a friar who gathered simples in the woods a grey-haired man he loved this little boy the boy loved him and when the friar taught him he soon could write with the pen and from that time lived chiefly at the convent or the castle so he became a very learned youth but oh poor wretch he read and read and read till his brain turned and ere his twentieth year he had unlawful thoughts of many things and though he prayed he never loved to pray with holy men nor in a holy place but yet his speech it was so soft and sweet the late lord velez ne'er was wearied with him and once as by the north side of the chapel they stood together chained in deep discourse the earth heaved under them with such a groan that the wall tottered and had well nigh fallen right on their heads my lord was sorely frightened a fever seized him and he made confession of all the heretical and lawless talk which brought this judgment so the youth was seized and cast into that hole my husband's father sobbed like a child it almost broke his heart and once as he was working in the cellar he heard a voice distinctly twas the youth's who sung a doleful song about the green fields how sweet it were on the lake or wild savannah to hunt for food and be a naked man and wander up and down at liberty he always doted on the youth and now his love grew desperate in defying death he made that cunning entrance i described and the young man escaped maria tis a sweet tale such as would lull a listening child to sleep his rosy face besoiled with unwiped tears and what became of him foster mother he went on shipboard with those bold voyagers who made discovery of golden lands leonie's younger brother went likewise and when he returned to spain he told leonie that the poor mad youth soon after they arrived in the new world in spite of his dissuasion seized a boat and all alone set sail by silent moonlight up a great river great as any sea and ne'er was heard of more but tis supposed he lived and died among the savage men end of the foster mother's tale recording by verity kendall Chapter Three of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Lines left upon a seat in a yew tree, which stands near the lake Vestwaite, on a desolate part of the shore, yet commanding a beautiful prospect. 
nay traveller rest this lonely yew tree stands far from all human dwelling what if here no sparkling rivulet spread the verdant herb what if these barren boughs be not loves yet if the wind breathes soft the curling waves that break against the shore shall lull thy mind by one soft impulse saved from vacancy who he was that piled these stones and with the mossy sod first covered o'er and taught this aged tree now wild to bend its arms in circling shade i will remember he was one who owned no common soul in youth by genius nursed and big with lofty views he to the world went forth pure in his heart against the taint of desolate tongues against jealousy and hate and scorn against all enemies prepared all but neglect and so his spirit damped at once with rash disdain he turned away and with the food of pride sustained his soul in solitude stranger these gloomy boughs had charms for him and here he loved sits his only visitants a straggling sheep the stone chat or the glancing sandpiper and on these barren rocks with juniper and heath and thistle thinly sprinkled o'er he fixed his downward eye he many an hour a morbid pleasure nourished tracing here an emblem of his own unfruitful life and lifting up his head he then would gaze on the more distant scene how lovely tis thou seest and he would gaze till it became far lovelier and his heart could not sustain the beauty still more beauteous nor that time would he forget those beings to whose mind warm from the labours of benevolence the world a man himself appeared a scene of kindred loveliness then he would sigh with mournful joy to think that others felt what he must never feel and so lost man on visionary views would fancy feed till his eyes streamed with tears in this deep vale he died the seat was only monument if thou be one whose heart the holy form of young imaginations have kept pure stranger henceforth be warned and know that pride howe'er disguised in its own majesty is littleness that he who feels contempt for any living thing hath faculties which he has never used that thought with him is in its infancy the man whose eye is ever on himself doth look on one the least of nature's works one who might move the wise man to that scorn which wisdom holds unlawful ever oh be wiser thou instructed that true knowledge leads to love true dignity abides with him alone who in the silent hour of inward thought can still suspect and still revere himself in lowliness of heart end of lines left upon a seat in a yew tree which stands near the lake of Eswate, on a desolate part of the shore yet commanding a beautiful prospect recording by verity kendall Chapter Four of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. The Nightingale, a conversational poem written in April, seventeen ninety eight no cloud no relic of the sunken day distinguishes the west no long thin slip of sullen light no obscure trembling hues come we will rest on this old mossy bridge you see the glimmer of the stream beneath but hear no murmuring it flows silently o'er its soft bed of verdure all is still a balmy night and though the stars be dim yet let us think upon the vernal showers that gladden the green earth and we shall find a pleasure in the dimness of the stars and hark the nightingale begins its song most musical most melancholy bird footnote one most musical most melancholy this passage in milton possesses an excellence far superior to that of mere description it is spoken in the character of the melancholy man and has therefore a dramatic propriety the author makes this remark to rescue himself from the charge of having alluded with levity to a line in milton a charge than which none could be more painful to him except perhaps that of having ridiculed his bible End of footnote. a melancholy bird o oh, idle thought in nature there is nothing melancholy but some night wandering man whose heart was pierced with the remembrance of a grievous wrong or slow distemper or neglected love and so poor wretch filled all these things with himself and made all gentle sounds tell back the tale of his own sorrows he and such as he first named these notes a melancholy strain and many a poet echoes the conceit poet who hath been building up the rhyme when he had better far have stretched his limbs beside a brook in a mossy forest dwell 
by sun or moonlight to the influxes of shapes and sounds and shifting elements surrendering his whole spirit of his song and of his fame forgetful so his fame should share in nature's immortality a venerable thing and so his song should make all nature lovelier and itself be loved like nature but twill not be so and youths and maidens most poetical who lose the deepening twilights of spring in ballrooms and hot theatres they still full of meek sympathy must heave their sighs over philomela's pity pleading strange my friend and my friend's sister we have learnt a different law we must not thus profane nature's sweet voice is always full of love and joyance tis the merry nightingale that crowds and hurries and precipitates with fast thick warble his delicious notes as he were fearful that an april night would be too short for him to utter forth his love chant and disburthen his full soul of all its music and i know a growth of large extent hard by a castle huge which the great lord inhibits not and so this grove is wild with tangling underwood and the trim walks are broken up and grass thin grass and king cups grow within the paths and never elsewhere in one place i knew so many nightingales and far and near in wood and thicket o'er the wide grove they answer and provoke each other's songs with skirmish and capricious passagings and murmurs musical and swift jug-jug and one low piping sound more sweet than all stirring the air with such a harmony that should you close your eyes you might almost forget it was not day on moonlight bushes whose dewy leaflets are but half disclosed you may perchance behold them on the twigs their bright bright eyes their eyes both bright and full glistening while many a glow-worm in the shade lights up her love-torch a most gentle maid who dwelleth in her hospitable home hard by the castle and at latest eve even like a lady vowed and dedicate to something more than nature in the grove glides through the pathways she knows all their notes that gentle maid and oft a moment's space what time the moon was lost behind a cloud hath heard a pause of silence till the moon emerging hath awakened earth and sky with one sensation and those wakeful birds have all burst forth in choral minstrelsy as if one quick and sudden gale had swept an hundred airy harps and she hath watched many a nightingale perch giddily on a blossomy twig still swinging from the breeze and to the motion tune his wanton song like tipsy joy that reels with tossing head farewell o warbler till to-morrow eve and you my friends farewell a short farewell we have been loitering long and pleasantly and now for our dear homes that strain again full fain it would delay me my dear babe who capable of no articulate sound miles all things with his imitative lips how he would place his hand beside his ear his little hand the small forefinger up and bid us listen and i deem it wise to make him nature's playmate he knows well the evening star and once when he awoke in most distressful mood some inward pain had made up that strange thing an infant's dream i hurried with him to our orchard plot and he beholds the moon and shushed at once suspends his sobs and laughs most silently while his fair eyes that swam with undropped tears did glitter in the yellow moonbeam well it is a father's tale but if that heaven should give me life his childhood shall grow up familiar with these songs that with the night he may associate with joy once more farewell sweet nightingale once more my friends farewell end of the nightingale recording by verity kendall chapter five of lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight by samuel taylor coleridge and william wordsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by verity kendall the female vagrant by derwent's side my father's cottage stood the woman thus her artless story told one field a flock and what the neighbouring floods supplied to him were more than mines of gold light was my sleep my days in transport rolled with thoughtless joy i stretched along the shore my father's nets or watched when from the fold high o'er the cliffs i led my fleecy store a dizzy depth below his boat and twinkling oar my father was a good pious man an honest man by honest parents bred and i believe that soon as i began to lisp he made me kneel beside my bed and in his hearing there my prayers i said and afterwards by my good father taught i read and loved the books in which i read for books in every neighbouring house i sought and nothing to my mind a sweeter pleasure brought 
can i forget what charms did once adorn my garden stored with peas and mint and thyme and rose and lily for the sabbath morn the sabbath bells and their delightful charm the gambols and wild freaks at shearing time my hen's rich nest through long grass scarce espied the cowslip gathering at may's dewy prime the swans that when i sought the waterside from far to meet me came spreading their snowy pride the staff i yet remember which upbore the bending body of my active sire his seat beneath the honeyed sycamore when the bees hummed in the chair by winter fire when market morning came the neat attire with which through bent on haste myself i decked my watchful dog who starts of furious ire when stranger passed so often i have checked the red breast known for years which at my casement pecked the sons of twenty summers danced along ah little marked how fast they rolled away then rose a mansion proud our woods among and cottage after cottage owned its sway no joy to see a neighbouring house or stray through the pastures not his own the master took my father dared his greedy wish gainsay he loved his old hereditary nook and ill could i the thought of such sad parting brook but when he had refused the pre-offered gold to cruel injuries he became a prey sore traversed in whate'er he brought and sold his troubles grew upon him day by day till all his substance fell into decay his little range of water was denied footnote two several of the lakes in the north of england are let out to different fishermen in parcels marked out by imaginary lines drawn from rock to rock End of footnote. all but the bed where his old body lay all all was seized and weeping side by side we sought a home where we uninjured might abide can i forget that miserable hour when from the last hilltop my sire surveyed peering above the trees the steeple tower that on his marriage day sweet music made till then he hoped his bones might there be laid close by my mother in their native bowers bidding me trust in god he stood and prayed i could not pray through tears that fell in showers glimmered our dear loved home alas no longer ours there was a youth whom i had loved so long that when i loved him not i cannot say mid the green mountains many and many a song we two had sung like little birds in may when we began to tire of childish play we seemed still more and more to prize each other we talked of marriage and our wedding day and i in truth did love him like a brother but never could i hope to meet with such another his father said that to a distant town he must repair to ply the artist's trade what tears of bitter grief till then unknown what tender vows our last sad kiss delayed to him we turned we had no other aid like one revived upon his neck i wept and her whom he had loved in joy he said he well could love in grief his faith he kept and in a quiet home once more my father slept four years each day with daily bread was blessed by constant toil and constant prayer supplied three lovely infants lay upon my breast and often viewing their sweet smiles i sighed and knew not why my happy father died when such distress reduced the children's meal thrice happy that from him the grave did hide the empty loom cold hearth and silent wheel and tears that flowed for ills which patience could not heal twas a hard change an evil time was come and no relief could gain but soon with proud parade the noisy drum beat round to sweep the streets of want and pain my husband's arms now only served to strain me and his children hungered in his view in such dismay my prayers and tears were vain to those whose miserable men he flew and now to the sea-coast with numbers more we drew there foul neglect for months and months we bore nor yet the crowded fleet its anchor stirred green fields before us and our native shore by fever from polluted air incurred ravage was made for which no knell was heard fondly we wished and wished away and nor knew mid that long sickness and those hopes deferred that happier days we never more must view the parting signals streamed at last the land withdrew but from delay the summer calms were past on as we drove the equinoctial deep ran mountains high before the howling blast we gazed with terror on the gloomy sleep of them that perished in the whirlwind's sweep untaught that soon such anguish must eschew our hopes such harvest of affliction reap that we the mercy of the waves should rue we reached the western world a poor devoted crew oh dreadful price of being so resigned all that it's dear in being better far in once more lonely cave till death to pine 
unseen, unheard, unwatched by any star, or in the streets and walks where proud men are, better our dying bodies to obtrude than dog-like, wading at the heels of war, protract a cursed existence with the brood that lap, their very nourishment, their brother's blood. The pains and plagues that on our heads came down, disease and famine, agony and fear, in wood or wilderness, in camp or town, it would thy brain unsettle even to hear all perished, all in one remorseless year, husband and children, one by one, by sword and ravenous plague, all perished, every tear dried up, despairing, desolate, on board a British ship I waked, as from a trance restored, peaceful at some immeasurable plain, by the first beams of dawning light impressed, in the calm sunshine slept the glittering main. The very ocean has its hour of rest that comes not to the human mourner's breast. Remote from man and, and storms of mortal care, a heavenly silence did the waves invest. I looked and looked along the silent air until it seemed to bring a joy to my despair. Ah, how unlike those late terrific sleeps and groans that rage of racking famine spoke, where looks inhumane dwelt on festering heaps, the breathing pestilence that rose like smoke, the shriek that from the distant battle broke the mind's dire earthquake and the pallid host driven by the bomb's incessant thunderstroke to loathsome vault where heartsick anguish tossed hope died and fear itself in agony was lost yet does the burst of woe congeal my frame when the dark streets appear to heave and gape while like a sea the storming army came and fire from hell reared his gigantic shape and murder by the ghastly gleam and rape seized their joint prey the mother and the child but from these crazing thoughts my brain escaped for weeks the balmy air breathed soft and mild and on the gliding vessel heaven and ocean smiled some mighty gulf of separation passed i seemed transported to another world a thought resigned with pain when from the mast the impatient mariner the sail unfurled and whistling called the wind that hardly curled the silent sea from sweet thoughts of home and from all hope i was forever hurled for me farthest from the earthly port to roam was best could I but shun the spot where man might come, and oft robbed of my perfect mind, I thought, at last my feet a resting place had found. Here will I weep in peace, so fancy wrought, roaming the illimitable waters round. Here watch of every human friend disowned, all day my ready tomb, the ocean flood, to break my dream the vessel reached its bound. And homeless near a thousand homes I stood, and near a thousand tables pined and wanted food. By grief enfeebled was I turned adrift, helpless as sailor cast on desert rock, nor morsel to my mouth that day did lift, nor dared my hand at any door to knock. I lay where with his drowsy mates the cock from the cross timber of an outhouse rung. How dismal told that night the city clock. At morn my sick heart hunger scarcely stung, nor to the beggar's language could I frame my tongue. So passed another day, and so the third. Then did I try in vain the crowd's resort to deep despair by frightful wishes stirred. Near the seaside I reached a roomful fort. There pains with nature could no more support with blindness linked did on my vitals fall. Dizzy my brain with interruption short of the hideous sense. I sunk nor step crawl, and thence was borne away to the neighbouring hospital. Recovery came with food, but still my brain was weak, nor of the past had memory. I heard my neighbours in their beds complain of many things which never troubled me, of feet still bustling round with busy glee, of looks where common kindness had no part, of service done with careless cruelty, fretting the fever round the languid heart, and groans which, as they said, would make a dead man start. These things just served to stir the torpid sense, nor pain nor pity in my bosom raised. Memory, though slow, returned with strength, and thence dismissed, again on open day I gazed at houses, men and common light amazed the lanes i sought and as the sun retired came where beneath the trees a faggot blazed the wild brood saw me weep my fate inquired and gave me food and rest more welcome more desired my heart is touched to think that men like these the rude earth's tenants were my first relief how kindly did they paint their vagrant ease and their long holiday that feared not grief for all belonged to all and each was chief no plough their sinews strained on grating road no wain they drove and yet the yellow sheaf in every vale for their delight was stowed for them in nature's meads the milky udder flowed semblance with straw and puneered ass they made of potters wandering on from door to door but life of happier sort to me portrayed and other joys my fancy to allure the bagpipe dinning on the midnight moor in barn uplighted and companions boon well met from far with revelry secure 
in the depth of the forest glade when jocund june rolled fast along the sky his warm and genial moon but ill it suited me in journey dark o'er moor a mountain midnight theft to hatch to charm the surly house-dog's faithful bark or hang on tiptoe at the lifted latch the gloomy lantern and the dim-lit match the black disguise the warning whistle shrill and ears still busy on its nightly watch were not for me brought up in nothing ill besides on grief so fresh my thoughts were brooding still what could i do unaided and unblessed poor father gone was every friend of thine and kindred of dead husband are at best small help and after marriage such as mine with little kindness would to me incline ill was i then for toil or service fit with tears whose cause no effort could confine by highway side forgetful would i sit whole hours my idle arms in moping sorrow knit i lived upon the mercy of the fields and oft of cruelty the sky accused on hazard or what gentle bounty yields now coldly given now utterly refused the fields i for my bed have often used but what afflicts my peace with keenest ruth is that i have my inner self abused forgone the home delights of constant truth and clear and open soul so prized in fearless youth three years a wanderer often have i viewed in tears the sun towards that country tend where my poor heart lost all its fortitude and now across this moor my steps i bend oh tell me whither for no earthly friend have i she ceased and weeping turn away as if because her tale was at an end she wept because she had no more to say of that perpetual weight which on her spirit lay end of the female vagrant recording by verity kendall Chapter Six of the Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Goody Blake and Harry Gill: A True Story. Oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? What is't that ails young Harry Gill? That evermore his teeth they chatter, 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 chatter still. Of waistcoats Harry has no lack. Good duffel grey and flannel fine. He hath a blanket on his back and coats enough to smother nine. In March, December, and in July, tis all the same with Harry Gill. The neighbours tell and tell you truly. His teeth they chatter, chatter still at night, at morning, and at noon, till all the same with Harry Gill. Beneath the sun, beneath the moon, his teeth they chatter, chatter still. Young Harry was a lusty drover, and who so stout of limb as he? His cheeks were red as ruddy clover, his voice was like the voice of three. Old Goody Blake was old and poor, ill fed she was, and thinly clad, and any man who passed her door might see how poor a hut she had. All day she spun in her poor dwelling, and then her three hours work at night. Alas, twas hardly worth the telling, it would not pay for candlelight. This woman dwelt in Dorsetshire, her hut was on a cold hillside, and in that country coals are dear, for they come far by wind and tide. By the same fire to boil their pottage, two poor old dames, as I have known, will often live in one small cottage, but she, poor woman, dwelt alone. "'Twas well enough when summer came, the long warm lightsome summer day, "'that at her door the canty dame would sit as any linnet gay. "'But when the ice our streams did fetter, oh, then how her old bones would shake! "'You would have said if you had met her, "'twas a hard time for Goody Blake. "'Her evenings then were dull and dead, sad case it was, as you may think, "'for very cold to go to bed, and then for cold not sleep a wink. "'Oh, joy for her, when air in winter, the winds at night had made a rout, and scattered many a lusty splinter, and many a rotten bough about. Yet never had she, well or sick, as every man who knew her says, a pile beforehand wood or stick enough to warm her for three days. Now when the frost was past enduring, and made her old bones to ache, could anything be more alluring than an old hedge to Goody Blake? And now and then it must be said, when her old bones were cold and chill, she left her fire or left her bed to seek the hedge of Harry Gill. Now Harry had long suspected this trespass of old Goody Blake, and vowed that she should be detected, and he on her would vengeance take, and oft from his warm fire he'd go, and to the fields his road would take, and there at night in frost and snow he watched to seize old Goody Blake. And once behind a rick of barley, thus looking out did Harry stand, the moon was full and shining clearly, and crisp with frost the stubble land. He hears a noise, he's all awake, again, on tiptoe down the hill, he softly creeps, tis Goody Blake, she's at the hedge of Harry Gill. 
Right glad was he when he beheld her. Stick after stick did Goody pull. He stood behind a bush of elder till she had filled her apron full. When with her load she turned about, the by-road back again to take, he started forward with a shout and sprang upon poor Goody Blake. And fiercely by the arm he took her, and by the arm he held her fast, and fiercely by the arm he shook her, and cried, I've caught you then at last. Then Goody, who had nothing said, the bundle from her lap let fell, and kneeling on the sticks she prayed, to God that is the judge of all. She prayed, her withered hand uprearing, while Harry held her by the arm. God, who art never out of hearing, oh, may he never more be warm. The cold, cold moon above her head, thus on her knees did Goody pray. Young Harry Gill heard what she said, and icy cold he turned away. He went complaining all the morrow, that he was cold and very chill. His face was gloom, his heart was sorrow. Alas, that day for Harry Gill. That day he wore a riding coat, but not a whit the warmer he. Another was on Thursday brought, and ere the Sabbath he had three. Twas all in vain a useless matter, and blankets were about him pinned. Yet still his jaws and teeth they clatter, like a loose casement in the wind. And Harry's flesh it fell away, and all who see him say it is plain, That live as long as live he may, he never will be warm again. No word to any man he utters, a bed or up, to young or old, But ever to himself he mutters, poor Harry Gill is very cold. A bed or up, by night or day, his teeth they chatter, chatter still. Now think ye farmers all, I pray, of Goody Blake and Harry Gill. End of Goody Blake and Harry Gill Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter 7 of Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lines written at a small distance from my house, and sent by my little boy to the person to whom they are addressed. It is the first mild day of March, each minute sweeter than before. The red breast sings from the tall larch that stands beside our door. There is a blessing in the air, which seems a sense of joy to yield to the bare trees and the mountains bare and grass and the green field my sister tis a wish of mine now that our morning meal is done make haste your morning task resign come forth and feel the sun edward will come with you and pray put on with speed your woodland dress and bring no book for this one day we give to idleness no joyless forms shall regulate our living calendar we from to-day my friend will date the opening of the year love and now universal birth from heart to heart is stealing from earth to man from man to earth it is the hour of feeling one moment now may give us more than fifty years of reason our minds shall drink at every pore the spirit of the season some silent laws our hearts may make which they shall long obey we for the year to come may take our temper from to-day and from the blessed power that rolls about below above will frame the measure of our souls they shall be tuned to love then come, my sister, come, I pray, with speed put on your woodland dress, and bring no book, for this one day we'll give to idleness. End of lines written at a small distance from my house, and sent by my little boy to the person to whom they are addressed. Recording by Verity Kendall. Chapter 8 of Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Simon Lee, the old huntsman, with an incident in which he was concerned. In the sweet shire of Cardigan, not far from Pleasant Ivor Hall, an old man dwells, a little man, I've heard he was once tall. A beast he has upon his back, no doubt a burthen weighty. He says he is three score and ten, but others say he's eighty. A long blue livery coat has he, that's fair behind and fair before. Yet meet him where you will, you see, at once that he is poor. Full five and twenty years he lived, a running huntsman merry. And though he has but one eye left, his cheek is like a cherry. No man like him the horn could sound, and no man was so full of glee. To say the least, four counties round had heard of Simon Lee. His master's dead, and no one now dwells in the hall of either. Men, dogs, and horses, all are dead. He is the sole survivor. His hunting feats have him bereft of his right eye, as you may see. And then what limbs those feats have left to poor old Simon Lee. He has no son, he has no child. His wife, an aged woman, lives with him near the waterfall, upon the village common. And he is lean, and he is sick, his little body's half awry. 
His ankles they are swollen and thick, His legs are thin and dry. When he was young he little knew Of husbandry or tillage, And now he's forced to work the weak, The weakest in the village. He all the country could outrun, Could leave both man and horse behind, And often ere the race was done He reeled and was stone blind. And still there's something in the world At which his heart rejoices, For when the chiming hounds are out He dearly loves their voices. Old Ruth works out of doors with him, and does what Simon cannot do, for she, not over stout of limb, is stouter of the two. And though you with your utmost skill from labour could not wean them, alas, tis very little all which they can do between them. Between their moss-grown hut of clay, not twenty paces from the door, a scrap of land they have, but they are poorest of the poor. This scrap of land he from the heath enclosed when he was stronger, but what avails the land to them? which they can till no longer. Few months of life he has in store, as he to you will tell, for still the more he works the more, his poor old ankles swell. My gentle reader, I perceive, how patiently you've waited, and I'm afraid that you expect some tale will be related. O oh, reader, had you in your mind such stores as silent thought can bring, O oh, gentle reader, you would find a tale in everything. What more I have to say is short, I hope you'll kindly take it, it is no tale, but should you think, perhaps a tale you'll make it. One summer I chanced to see, this old man doing all he could, around the root of an old tree, a stump of rotten wood, the mattock tottered in his hand, so vain was his endeavour, that at the root of the old tree he might have worked for ever. You're overtasked, good Simon Lee, give me your tool, to him I said, and at the word right gladly he received my proffered aid. I struck, and with a single blow, the tangled root I severed, at which the poor old man so long and vainly had endeavoured. The tears into his eyes were brought, and thanks and praises seemed to run, so fast out of his heart, I thought, they never would have done. I've heard of hearts unkind, kind deeds, with coldness still returning. Alas, the gratitude of men has oftener left me mourning. End of Simon Lee, The Old Huntsman Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter Nine of Lyrical Ballads, 1798. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Anecdote for fathers showing how the art of lying may be taught. I have a boy of five years old, his face is fair and fresh to see, his limbs are cast in beauty's mould, and dearly he loves me. One morn we strolled on our dry walk, our quiet house all full in view, and held such intermitted talk as we were wont to do. My thoughts on the former pleasures ran, I thought of Kilve's delightful shore, my pleasant home when spring began, a long, long year before. A day it was when I could bear, think and think and think again, with so much happiness to spare, I could not feel a pain. My boy was by my side so slim and graceful in his rustic dress, and oftentimes I talked to him in very idleness. The young lambs ran a pretty race, the morning sun shone bright and warm. Kilve, said I, was a pleasant place, and so is Lisbon Farm. My little boy, which like you more, I said, and took him by the arm, our home by Kilve's delightful shore, or here at Lisbon Farm. And tell me, had you rather be, I said and held him by the arm, at Kilsmith's shore by Green Sea, or here at this wind farm? In careless mood he looked at me, while still I held him by the arm, and said, at Kilv I'd rather be, than here at Liswin farm. Now, little Edward, say why so, my little Edward, tell me why. I cannot tell, I do not know, why this is strange, said I. For here are woods and green hills warm, there surely must some reason be, why you would change sweet Liswin farm, for killed by the green sea. At this my boy, so fair and slim, hung down his head, nor made reply, and five times did I say to him, Why, Edward, tell me why? His head he raised, there was in sight, it caught his eye, he saw it plain, upon the housetop glittering bright, a broad and gilded vein. Then did the boy his tongue unlock, and thus to me he made reply, At Kilve there was no weathercock, and that's the reason why. O oh, dearest, dearest boy, my heart, for better law would seldom yearn, could I but teach the hundredth part of what from thee I learn. End of Anecdote for Fathers Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter 9 
Chapter Ten of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. We are seven. A simple child, dear brother Jim, that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl, she was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair, her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the cottage yard I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet you are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Then did the little maid reply, seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie, beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs they are alive, if two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five their graves are green they may be seen the little maid replied twelve steps or more from my mother's door and they are side by side my stockings there i often knit my kerchief there i hem and there upon the ground i sit i sit and sing to them and often after sunset sir when it is light and fairer i take my little porringer and eat my supper there the first that died was little jane in bed she moaning lay till god released her of her pain and then she went away so in the churchyard she was laid, and all the summer dry, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then, said I, if two are in heaven? The little maid did reply, O oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead, those two are dead, their spirits are in heaven. Twas throwing words away for still, the little maid would have her will, and said, Nay, we are seven. End of We Are Seven. Recording by Verity Kendall. Chapter 11 of Lyrical Ballads, 1798. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Lines written in early spring. I heard a thousand blended notes, while in a grove I sat reclined, in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much has grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. Through primrose tufts in that sweet bower the periwinkle trailed its wreath, and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. The birds around me hopped and played, the thoughts I cannot measure, but the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. The budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air, and I must think do all I can, there was pleasure there. If I these thoughts may not prevent, if such be of my creed the plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? End of Lines Written in Early Spring Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter 12 of Lyrical Ballads, 1798 By Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall The Thorn 1 there is a thorn, it looks so old. In truth you'd find it hard to say how it could ever have been young. It looks so old and grey, not higher than a two years child. It stands erect, this aged thorn. No leaves it has, no thorny points. It is a mass of knotted joints, a wretched thing forlorn. It stands erect, and like a stone, with lichens it is overgrown. 2. Like rock or stone it is overgrown, with lichens to the very top, and hung with heavy tufts of moss. A melancholy crop. Up from the earth these mosses creep, And this poor thorn they clasp it round, So close you'd say that they were bent, With plain and manifest intent, To drag it to the ground, And all had joined in one endeavour, To bury this poor thorn for ever. 3. 
high on a mountain's highest ridge where oft the stormy winter gale cuts like a scythe while through the clouds it sweeps from vale to vale not five yards from this mountain pass this thorn you on your left espy and to the left three yards beyond you see a little muddy pond of water never dry i've measured it from side to side tis three feet long and two feet wide four and close beside this aged thorn there is a fresh and lovely sight a beauteous heap a hill of moss just half a foot in height all lovely colours there you see or colours that were ever seen and mossy network too is there as if by hand of lady fair the work had woven been and cups the darlings of the eye so deep is their vermilion dye five ah me what lovely tints are there of olive green and scarlet bright in spikes in branches and in stars green red and pearly white this heap of earth o'ergrown with moss which close beside the thorn you see so fresh in all its beauteous dyes is like an infant's grave in size as like as like can be but never never anywhere an infant's grave was half so fair six now would you see this aged thorn this pond and beauteous hill of moss you must take care and choose your time the mountain went across for oft there sits between the heap that's like an infant's grave in size and that same pond of which i spoke a woman in a scarlet cloak and to herself she cries o oh misery o oh misery o oh woe is me o oh misery seven at all times of the day and night this wretched woman thither goes and she is known to every star and every wind that blows and there beside the thorn she sits when the blue daylight's in the skies and when the whirlwind's on the hill or frosty air is keen and still and to herself she cries o oh misery o oh misery o oh woe is me o oh misery eight now wherefore thus by day or night in rain in tempest and in snow thus to the dreary mountain top does this poor woman go and why sits she beside the thorn when the blue daylight's in the sky or when the whirlwind's on the hill or the frosty air is keen and still and wherefore does she cry o oh, wherefore wherefore tell me why does she repeat that doleful cry nine i cannot tell i wish i could for the true reason no one knows but if you'd gladly follow the spot the spot to which she goes the heap that's like an infant's grave the pond and thorn so old and grey pass by her door tis seldom shut and if you see her in her hut then to the spot away i never heard of such a dare approach the spot when she is there ten but wherefore to the mountain top can this unhappy woman go whatever star is in the skies whatever wind may blow nay rack your brain tis all in vain i'll tell you everything i know but to the thorn and to the pond which is a little step beyond i wish that you would go perhaps when you are at the place you something of her tale may trace eleven i'll give you the best help i can before you up the mountain go up to the dreary mountain top i'll tell you all i know tis now some two and twenty years since she her name is martha ray gave with a maiden's true good will her company to stephen hill and she was blithe and gay and she was happy happy still whene'er she thought of stephen hill twelve and they had fixed the wedding day the morning that must wed them both but stephen to another maid had sworn another oath and with this other maiden to church unthinking stephen went poor martha on that woeful day a cruel cruel fire they say into her bones was sent it dried her body like a cinder and almost turned her brain to tinder Thirteen. They say full six months after this, while yet the summer leaves were green, she to the mountain top would go, and there was often seen, tis said, a child was in her womb, as now to any eye was plain. She was with the child, and she was mad, yet often she was sober sad, from her exceeding pain. Oh me, ten thousand times I'd rather that he had died, that cruel father! Sixteen. Sad case for such a brain to hold, communion with a stirring child. Sad case, as you may think, for one who had a brain so wild. Last Christmas, when we talked of this, old Father Simpson did maintain that in her womb the infant wrought about its mother's heart and brought her senses back again. And when at last her time drew near, her looks were calm, her senses clear. Fifteen. No more, I know. I wish I did, and I would tell it all to you. For what became of this poor child? There's none that ever knew. And if a child was born or no there's no one that could ever tell and if twas born alive or dead there's no one knows as i have said but some remember well that martha ray about this time would up the mountain often climb sixteen 
and all that winter when at night the wind blew from the mountain peak twas worth your while though in the dark the churchyard path to seek for many a time and oft were heard cries coming from the mountain head some plainly living voices were and others i've heard many swear were voices of the dead i cannot think whate'er they say they had to do with martha ray seventeen but that she goes to this old thorn the thorn which i have described to you and there sits in the scarlet cloak i will be sworn is true for one day with my telescope to view the ocean wide and bright when to this country first i came ere i had heard of martha's name i climbed to the mountain's height a storm came on and i could see no object higher than my knee eighteen twas mist and rain and storm and rain no screen no fence could i discover and then the wind in faith it was a wind full ten times over i looked around i thought i saw a jutting crag and oft i ran head foremost through the driving rain the shelter of the crag to gain and as i am a man instead of a jutting crag i found a woman seated on the ground nineteen i did not speak i saw her face her face it was enough for me i turned about and heard her cry o oh, misery o oh, misery and there she sits until the moon through half the clear blue sky will go and when the little breezes make the waters of the pond to shake as all the country know she shudders and you hear her cry o oh, misery o oh, misery twenty but what's the thorn and what's the pond and what's the hill of moss to her and what's the creeping breeze that comes this little pond to stir i cannot tell but some will say she hanged her baby on the tree some say she drowned it in the pond which is a little step beyond but all and each agree the little babe was buried there beneath the hill of moss so fair twenty one i've heard the scarlet moss is red with drops of that poor infant's blood but kill a new-born infant thus i do not think she could some say if to the pond you go and fix on it a steady view the shadow of a baby trace a baby in a baby's face and that it looks at you whene'er you look at it it is plain the baby looks at you again twenty two and some had sworn an oath that she should be to public justice brought and for the little infant bones with spades they would have sought but then the beauteous hill of moss before their eyes began to stir and for fifty yards around the grass it shook upon the ground but all do still aver the little babe is buried there beneath the hill of moss so fair twenty three i cannot tell how this may be but plain it is the thorn is bound with heavy tufts of moss that strive to drag it to the ground and this i know for many a time when she was on the mountain high by day and in the silent night when all the stars shone clear and bright that i have heard her cry o oh misery o oh misery o oh woe is me o oh misery end of the thorn recording by verity kendall Chapter Thirteen of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. The Last of the Flock. In distant countries I have been, and yet I have not often seen a healthy man, a man full grown, weep in the public roads alone but such a one on english ground and in the broad highway i met along the broad highway he came his cheeks with tears were wet sturdy he seemed though he was sad and in his arms a lamb he had he saw me and turned aside as if he wished himself to hide then with his coat he made a say to wipe those briny tears away i followed him and said my friend what ails you wherefore weep ye so shame on me sir this lusty lamb he makes my tears to flow to-day i fetched him from the rock he is the last of all my flock when i was young a single man and after youthful follies ran though little given to care and thought yet so it was a ewe i bought and other sheep from her i raised as healthy sheep as you might see and then i married and was rich as i could wish to be of sheep i numbered a full score and every year increased my store year after year my stock it grew and from this one this single ewe full fifty comely sheep i raised as sweet a flock as ever grazed upon the mountain did they feed they throve and we at home did thrive this lusty lamb of all my store is all that is alive and now i care not if we die and perish all of poverty ten children sir had i to feed hard labour in a time of need my pride was tamed and in our grief i of the parish asked relief they said i was a wealthy man my sheep upon the mountain fed and it was fit that thence i took 
whereof to buy us bread do this how can we give to you they cried what to the poor is due i sold a sheep as they had said and bought my little children bread and they were healthy with their food for me it never did me good a woeful time it was for me to see the end of all my gains the pretty flock which i had reared with all my care and pains to see it melt like snow away for me it was a woeful day another still and still another a little lamb and then its mother it was a vein that never stopped like blood drops from my heart they dropped till thirty were not left alive they dwindled dwindled one by one and i may say that many a time i wished they all were gone they dwindled one by one away and for me it was a woeful day to wicked deeds i was inclined and wicked fancies crossed my mind and every man i chanced to see i thought he knew some ill of me no peace no comfort could i find no ease within doors or without and crazily and wearily i went my work about oft times i thought to run away for me it was a woeful day sir twas a precious flock to me as dear as my own children be for daily with my growing store i loved my children more and more alas it was an evil time god cursed me in my sore distress i prayed yet every day i thought i loved my children less and every week and every day my flock it seemed to melt away they dwindled sir sad sight to see from ten to five from five to three a lamb a weather and a ewe and then at last from three to two and of my fifty yesterday i had but only one and here it lies upon my arm alas and i have none to-day i fetched it from the rock it is the last of all my flock end of the last of the flock recording by verity kendall Chapter Fourteen of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. The Dungeon. And this place our forefathers made for man. This is the process of our love and wisdom to each poor brother who offends against us, most innocent perhaps. But what if guilty? Is this the only cure? Merciful God each poor and natural outlet shrivelled up by ignorance and parching poverty his energies roll back upon his heart and stagnate and corrupt till changed to poison they break out on him like a loathsome plague spot then we call in our pampered mountbacks and this is their best cure uncomforted and friendless solitude groaning and tears and savage faces at the clanking hour seen through the streams and vapour of his dungeon by the lamp's dismal twilight so he lies circled with evil till his very soul unmoulds its essence hopelessly deformed by the sights of ever more deformity with other ministrations thou o nature healst thy wandering and distempered child thou pawst on him thy soft influences thy sunny hues fair forms and breathing sweets thy melodies of woods and winds and waters till he relent and can no more endure to be a jarring and desolate thing amid this general dance and minstrelsy but bursting into tears wins back his way his angry spirit healed and harmonized by the benign touch of love and beauty end of the dungeon Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter fifteen of Lyrical Ballads seventeen ninety eight by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall The Mad Mother her eyes are wild her head is bare the sun has burnt her coal-black hair her eyebrows have a rusty stain and she came far from over the main she has a baby on her arm or else she were alone and under the haystack warm and on the greenwood stone she talked and sung the woods among and it was in the english tongue sweet babe they say that i am mad but nay my heart is far too glad and i am happy when i sing for many a sad and doleful thing then lovely baby do not fear i pray thee have no fear of me but safe as in a cradle here my lovely baby thou shalt be to thee i know too much i owe i cannot work thee any woe a fire was once within my brain and in my head a dull dull pain and fiendish faces one two three hung at my breasts and pulled at me and then there came a sight of joy it came at once to do me good i waked and saw my little boy my little boy of flesh and blood oh joy for me that sight to see for he was here and only he 
suck little babe oh suck again it cools my blood it cools my brain thy lips i feel them baby they draw from my heart the pain away oh press me with thy little hand it loosens something at my chest about that tight and deadly band i feel thy little fingers pressed the breeze i see is in the tree it comes to cool my babe in me oh love me love me little boy thou art thy mother's only joy and do not dread the waves below when o'er the sea-rock's edge we go the high crag cannot work me harm nor leaping torrents when they howl the babe i carry on my arm he saves for me my precious soul then happy life full blessed am i without me my sweet babe would die then do not fear my little boy for thee bold as a lion i will be and i will always be thy guide through hollow snows and rivers wide i'll build an indian bower i know the leaves that make the softest bed and if from me thou wilt not go but still be true till i am dead my pretty thing then thou shalt sing as merry as the birds in spring thy father cares not for my breast tis thine sweet babe there to rest tis all thine own and if its hue be changed that was so far to view tis fair enough for thee my dove my beauty little child is flown but thou wilt live with me in love and what if my poor cheek is brown tis well for me thou canst not see how plain and wan it else would be but dread not their taunts my little life i am thy father's wedded wife and underneath the spreading tree we two did live in honesty if his sweet boy he could forsake with me he never would have stayed for him no harm my babe can take for he poor man is wretched made and every day we two will pray for him that's gone and far away i'll teach my boy the sweetest things i'll teach him how the owlet sings my little babe thy lips are still hast thou almost sucked thy fill where art thou gone my own dear child what wicked looks are these i see alas alas that look so wild it never never came from me if thou art mad my pretty lad then i must be for ever sad oh smile on me my little lamb for i thy own dear mother am my love for thee has well been tried i sought thy father far and wide i know the poisons of the shade i know the earth nuts fit for food then pretty dear be not afraid we'll find thy father in the wood now laugh and be gay to the woods away and there my babe will live for a end of the mad mother recording by verity kendall Chapter Sixteen of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. The Idiot Boy. Tis eight o'clock, a clear March night. The moon is up, the sky is blue. The owlet in the moonlight air. He shouts from nobody knows where. He lengthens out his lonely shout. Halloo, halloo, a long halloo why bustle fuss about your door what means this bustle betty foy why are you in this mighty fret and why on horseback have you set him whom you love your idiot boy beneath the moon that shines so bright till she is tired let betty foy with girt and stirrup fiddle faddle but wherefore set upon a saddle him whom she loves her idiot boy there's scarce a soul that's out of bed good betty put him down again his lips with joy they burr at you but betty what has he to do with stirrup saddle or with rein the world will say tis very idle to think you of the time of night there's not a mother no not one but when she hears what you have done oh betty she'll be in a fright but betty's bent on her intent for her good neighbour susan gale old susan she who dwells alone is sick and makes a piteous moan as if her very life would fail there's not a house within a mile no hand to help them in distress old susan lies a bed in pain and sorely puzzled are the twain for what she else they cannot guess and betty's husband at the wood where by the week he doth abide a woodman in the distant vale there's none to help poor susan gale what must be done what will betide and betty from the lane has fetched her pony that is mild and good whether he be in joy or pain feeding at will along the lane or bringing faggots from the wood and he is all in travelling trim and by the moonlight betty foy has up upon the saddle set the like was never heard of yet him whom she loves her idiot boy and he must post without delay across the bridge that's in the dale and by the church and no other down to bring a doctor from the town or she will die old susan gale there is no need of boot or spur there is no need of whip or wand for johnny has his holly bough and with a hurly-burly now he shakes the green bough in his hand and betty o'er and o'er has told 
the boy who is her best delight both what to follow what to shun what to do and what to leave undone how turn to left and how to right and betty's most special charge was johnny johnny mind the chew come home again nor stop at all come home again whate'er befall my johnny do i pray you do to this did johnny answer make both with his head and with his hand and proudly shook the bridle too and then his words were not a few which betty well could understand and now that johnny is just going though betty's in a mighty flurry she gently pats her pony's side on which her idiot boy must ride and seems no longer in a hurry but when the pony moves his legs oh then for the poor idiot boy for joy he cannot hold the bridle for joy his head and heels are idle he's idle all for very joy and while the pony moves his legs in johnny's left hand you might see the green brows motionless and dead the moon that shines above his head is not more still and mute than he his heart it was so full of glee that till full fifty yards were gone he quite forgot his holly whip and all his skill in horsemanship oh happy 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 john and betty's standing at the door and betty's face with joy o'erflows proud of herself and proud of him she sees him in his travelling trim how quietly her johnny goes the silence of her idiot boy what hopes it sends to betty's heart he's at the guide-post he turns right she watches till he's out of sight and betty will not then depart burr burr now johnny's lips they burr as loud as any mill or near it meek as a lamb the pony moves and johnny makes the noise he loves and betty listens glad to hear it away she hides to susan gale and johnny's in a merry tune the owlets hoop the owlets cur and johnny's lips they burr 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 and on he goes beneath the moon his steed and he right well agree for of this pony there's a rumour that should he lose his eyes and ears and should he live a thousand years he never will be out of humour but then he is a horse that thinks and when he thinks his pace is slack now though he knows poor johnny well yet for his life he cannot tell what he has got upon his back so through the moonlight lanes they go and far into the moonlight dale and by the church and o'er the down to bring a doctor from the town to comfort poor old susan gale and betty now at susan's side is in the middle of her story what comfort to johnny soon will bring with many a most diverting thing of johnny's wit and johnny's glory and betty's still at susan's side by this time she's not quite so flurried demure with porridge and plate she sits as if in susan's fate her life and soul were buried but betty poor good woman she you plainly in her face may read it could lend out of that moment's store five years of happiness or more to any that might need it but yet i guess that now and then with betty all was not so well and to the road she turns her ears and thence full many a sound she hears which she to susan will not tell poor susan moans poor susan groans as sure as there's a moon in heaven cries betty he'll be back again they'll both be here it is almost ten they'll both be here before eleven poor susan moans poor susan groans the clock gives warning for eleven tis on the stroke if johnny's near quoth betty he will soon be here as soon as there's a moon in heaven the clock is on the strike of twelve and johnny is not yet in sight the moon's in heaven as betty sees but betty is not quite at ease and susan has a dreadful night and betty half an hour ago on johnny's vile reflections cast a little idle sauntering thing with other names an endless string but now that time is gone and past and betty's drooping at the heart that happy time all past and gone how can it be he is so late the doctor has made him wait susan they'll both be here anon and susan's growing worse and worse and betty's in a sad quandary and then there's no one to say if she must go or she must stay she's in a sad quandary the clock is on the stroke of one and neither doctor nor his guide appear along the moonlight road there's neither horse nor man abroad and betty's still at susan's side and susan she begins to fear of sad mischances not a few that johnny may perhaps be drowned or lost perhaps and never found which they must both for ever rue she prefaced half a hint of this with god forbid it should be true at the first word that susan said cried betty rising from the bed susan i'd gladly stay with you i must be gone i must away consider johnny's but half wise susan we must take care of him if he is hurt in life or limb oh god forbid poor susan cries what can i do says betty going what can i do to ease your pain good susan tell me and i'll stay 
I fear you're in a dreadful way, that I shall soon be back again. Good Betty, go, good Betty, go, there's nothing that can ease my pain. Then off she hides, but with a prayer, that God poor Susan's life would spare, till she comes back again. So through the moonlight lane she goes, and far into the moonlight dale, and how she ran, and how she walked, and all that to herself she talked, would surely be a tedious tale. In high and low, above, below, in great and small, in round and square, in tree and tower was Johnny seen, in bush and brake, in black and green, twas Johnny, Johnny everywhere. She passed the bridge that's in the dale, and now the thought to mince her sore, Johnny perhaps his horse forsook, to hunt the moon that's in the brook, and never will be heard of more. And now she's high upon the down, alone amid a prospect wide, there's neither Johnny nor his horse, among the fern or in the gorse, there's neither doctor nor his guide. O oh, saints, what is become of him? Perhaps he's cried into an oak, where he will stay till he is dead, or sadly he has been misled, and joined the wandering gypsy folk. Or him that wicked ponies carried, to the dark cave, the goblins hall, or in the castle he's pursuing, among the ghosts his own undoing, or playing with the waterfall. At poor old Susan then she railed, while to the town she posts away. If Susan had not been so ill, alas, I should have had him still, my Johnny, till my dying day. Poor Betty, in this sad distemper, the doctor's self would hardly spare. Unworthy things she talked and wild, even he of cattle the most wild, the pony had his share. And now she's got into the town, and to the doctor's door she hies. Tis silence all on every side, the town so long, the town so wide, is silent as the skies. And now she's at the doctor's door, she lifts the knocker, rap, 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 the doctor at the casement shoes, his glimmering eyes that peep and doze, and one hand rubs his old nightcap. Oh, doctor, doctor, where's my Johnny? I'm here, what is it you want from me? Oh, sir, you know I'm Betty Foy, and I have lost my poor dear boy. You know him, him you often see. He's not so wise as some folks be. The devil takes his wisdom, said, said the doctor, looking somewhat grim. What woman? Should I know of him? And grumbling, he went back to bed. Oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me, here will I die, here will I die, I thought to find my Johnny here, but he is neither far nor wide, oh, what a wretched mother I! She stops, she stands, she looks about, which way to turn she cannot tell, poor Betty, it would ease her pain, if she had heart to knock again, the clock strikes three, a dismal knell, then up along the town she hides, no wonder if her senses fail, this piteous news, so much it shocked her, she quite forgot to send the doctor, the comfort of poor old Susan Gale. And now she's high upon the down, and she can see a mile of road. Oh, cruel, I am almost three score. Such night as this were ne'er before. There's not a single soul abroad. She listens, but she cannot hear. The foot of horse, the voice of man. The streams with softest sound are flowing. The grass, you almost hear it growing. You hear it now as e'er you can. The owlets through the long blue night are shouting to each other still. Fond lovers, yet not quite hobnob. They lengthen out the tremulous sob, that echoes far from hill to hill. Poor Betty now has lost all hope, her thoughts are bent on deadly sin. A green ground pond she just has passed, and from the brink she hurries fast, lest she should drown herself therein. And now she sits her down and weeps, such tears she never shed before. Oh dear, dear pony, my sweet joy, oh carry back my idiot boy, and we will ne'er o'er loathe thee more. A thought is coming to her head. The pony, he is mild and good, and we have always used him well. Perhaps he's gone along the dell and carried Johnny to the wood. Then up she springs as if on wings. She thinks no more of deadly sin. If Betty fifty ponds should see, the last of all her thoughts would be to drown herself therein. O oh, reader, now that I might tell what Johnny and his horse are doing, what they've been doing all this time, oh, could I put it into rhyme, a most delightful tale pursuing and perhaps no unlikely thought he with his pony now doth roam the cliffs and peaks so high that are to lay his hands upon a star and in his pocket bring it home perhaps he's turned himself about his face unto the horse's tail and silent and mute and wandering lost all like a silent horseman's ghost he travels on along the vale and now perhaps he's hunting sheep a fierce and dreadful hunter he john bell that's so trim and green in five months time should he be seen a desert wilderness will be perhaps with head and heels on fire and like the very soul of evil he's galloping away away and so he'll gallop on for a the bane of all that dreads the devil 
I deceive music has been bound These fourteen years by strong indentures. O oh, gentle muses, let me tell But half of what to him befell, For sure he met with strange adventures. O oh, gentle muses, is this kind? Why will ye thus my suit repel? Why of your further aid bereave me? And can ye thus unfriended leave me? Ye muses, whom I love so well, Who's yon that near the waterfall, Which thunders down with headlong force, Beneath the moon yet shining fair, As careless as if nothing were, Sits upright on a feeding horse. Unto his horse that's feeding free, He seems, I think, the rein to give, Of moon or stars he takes no heed, Of such William romance to read, Since Johnny, Johnny, as I live, And that's the very pony too. Where is she? Where is Betty Foy? She hardly can sustain her fears, The roaring waterfall she hears, And cannot find her idiot boy. Your pony's worth his weight in gold, then calm your terrors, Betty Foy. She's coming from among the trees, And now all full in view she sees, Him whom she loves, her idiot boy. And Betty sees the pony too. Why stand you thus, good Betty Foy? It is no goblin, tis no ghost, Tis he whom you so long have lost, He whom you love, your idiot boy. She looks again, her arms are up, She screams, she cannot move for joy, She dances with the torrent's force, She almost has o'erturned the horse, And fast she holds her idiot boy. And Johnny birds and laughs aloud, whether in cunning or in joy I cannot tell. But while he laughs, Betty a drunken pleasure quaffs to hear again her idiot boy. And now she's at the pony's tail, and now she's at the pony's head, on that side now and now on this, and almost stifled with her bliss, a few sad tears does Betty shed. She kisses o'er and o'er again, him whom she loves her idiot boy. She's happy here, she's happy there. She is uneasy everywhere, her limbs are all alive with joy. She pats the pony where and when, she knows not happy Betty Foy. The little pony glad may be, but he is milder far than she. You hardly can perceive his joy. Oh, Johnny, never mind the doctor, you've done your best and that is all. She takes the reins when this was said, and gently turns the pony's head from the loud waterfall. By this the spells were almost gone, the moon was setting on the hill. So palely scarcely looked at her, the little birds began to stir, though yet their tongues were still. Pony, Betty, and her boy went slowly through the woody dale, and who is she betimes abroad that hobbles up the steep rough road? Who is it but old Susan Gale? Long Susan lay deep lost in thought, and many dreadful fears beset her, both for her messenger and nurse, and as her mind grew worse and worse, her body it grew better. She turned, she tossed herself in bed, on all sides doubts and terrors met her, point after point did she discuss, and while her mind was fighting for, her body still grew better. Alas, what is become of them? These fears can never be endured. I'll to the wood, the word scarce said, did Susan rise up from her bed, as if by magic cured. Away she posts up hill and down, and to the wood at length is come. She spies her friends, she shouts a greeting, oh me, it is a merry meeting as ever was in Christendom. The owls have hardly sung their last, while our four travellers homeward wend. The owls have hooted all night long, and with the owls began my song, and with the owls must end. For while they were travelling home, cried Betty, tell us, Johnny, do, where all this long night you have been, what you have heard, what you have seen, and Johnny, mind you, tell us true. Now Johnny all night long had heard, the owls in tuneful concert stride, no doubt too he the moon had seen, for in the moonlight he had been from eight o'clock till five, and thus to Betty's question he made answer like a traveller bold, whose very words I give to you, the cock did crow to woo to woo, and the sun did shine so cold, thus answered Johnny in his glory, and that was all his traveller's story. End of The Idiot Boy Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter Seventeen of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lines written near Richmond upon the Thames at evening. How rich the wave in front impressed with evening twilight's summer hues, while facing thus the crimson west, the boat her silent path pursues. And see how dark the backward stream. A little moment passed so smiling, And still perhaps with faithless gleam Some other loiterer beguiling. Such views the youthful bard allure, But heedless of the following gloom, He deems their colours shall endure, 
till peace go with him to the tomb and let him nurse his fond deceit and what if he must die in sorrow who would not cherish dreams so sweet though grief and pain may come to-morrow glide gently thus for ever glide o thames that other bards may see as lovely visions by thy side as now fair river come to me o glide fair stream for ever so thy quiet soul on all bestowing till all our minds for ever flow as thy deep waters now are flowing vain thought yet be as now thou art that in thy waters may be seen the image of a poet's heart how bright how solemn how serene such heart did once the poet bless who pouring here a later ditty. Footnote 3. Collins' Ode on the Death of Thompson, the last written, I believe, of the poems which were published during his lifetime. This ode is also alluded to in the next stanza. End of footnote. Could find no refuge from distress, but in the milder grief of pity. Remembrance, as we glide along, for him suspend the dashing oar, and pray that never child of song may know his freezing sorrows more. How calm, how still, the only sound, the dripping of the oar suspended, the evening darkness gathers round, by virtue's holiness powers attended. End of lines written near Richmond upon the Thames at evening. Recording by Verity Kendall. Chapter 18 of Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Expostulation and reply. Why, William, on that old grey stone, thus for the length of half a day, why, William, sit you thus alone, and dream your time away? Where are your books, that like bequest, to beings else forlorn and blind, up, up, and drink the spirit breathed, from dead men to their kind? You look round on your mother earth, as if she for no purpose bore you, as if you were her first-born birth, and none had lived before you. One morning thus, by Esthwaite late, when life was sweet, I knew not why, to me my good friend Matthew spake, and thus I made reply. The eye it cannot choose but see, we cannot bid the ear be still, our bodies feel, where'er they be, against or with our will. Nor less I deem that there are powers, which of themselves our minds impress, that we can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. Think you mid all this mighty sum of things forever speaking that nothing of itself will come, but we must still be seeking. Then ask not wherefore here alone, conversing as I may, I sit upon this old grey stone and dream my time away. End of expostulation and reply. Recording by Verity Kendall. Chapter Nineteen of Lyrical Ballads, Seventeen Ninety Eight by samuel taylor coleridge and william wordsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by verity kendall the tables turned an evening scene on the same subject up up my friend and clear your looks why all this toil and trouble up up my friend and quit your books or surely you'll grow double the sun above the mountain's head a freshening lustre mellow through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow books tis a dull and endless strife come here the woodland linnet how sweet his music on my life there's more of wisdom in it and hark how blithe the thostrel sings and he is no mean preacher come forth into the light of things let nature be your teacher she has a world of ready wealth our minds and hearts to bless spontaneous wisdom breathed by health truth breathed by cheerfulness one impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Sweet is the law which nature brings, our meddling intellect, misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art, close up these barren leaves, come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. End of Tables Turned, an Evening Scene on the Same Subject Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter Twenty of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Old Man Travelling, Animal Tranquillity and Decay, a Sketch. The little hedgerow birds that peck along the road regard him not. He travels on, and in his face, his step, his gait is one expression. Every limb, his look and bending figure 
all bespeak a man who does not move with pain but moves with thought he is insensibly subdued to settled quiet he is one by whom all effort seems forgotten one to whom long patience has such mild composure given that patience now doth seem a thing of which he hath no need he is by nature led to peace so perfect that the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels i asked him whither he was bound and what the object of his journey he replied sir i am going many miles to take a last leave of my son a mariner who from a sea-fight has been brought to falmouth and there is dying in an hospital end of old man travelling recording by verity kendall Chapter Twenty One of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. The complaint of a forsaken Indian woman. When a northern Indian from sickness is unable to continue his journey with his companions, he is left behind, covered over with deer skins, and is supplied with water, food, and fuel if the situation of the place will afford it he is informed of the track which his companions intend to pursue and if he is unable to follow or overtake them he perishes alone in the desert unless he should have good fortune to fall in with some other tribe of indians it is unnecessary to add that females are equally or still more exposed to the same fate see that very interesting work hearn's journey from hudson bay to the northern ocean when the northern lights as the same writer informs us vary their position in the air they make a rustling and a crackling noise this circumstance is alluded to in the first stanza of the following poem. Before I see another day, oh, let my body die away. In sleep I heard the northern gleams, the stars they were among my dreams. In sleep did I behold the skies, I saw the crackling flashes drive, and yet they are upon my eyes, and yet I am alive. Before I see another day, oh, let my body die away. My fire is dead, it knew no pain yet it is dead and i remain all stiff with ice the ashes lie and they are dead and i will die when i was well i wished to live for clothes for warmth for food and fire but they to me no joy can give no pleasure now and no desire then here contented will i lie alone i cannot fear to die alas you might have dragged me on another day a single one too soon despair o'er me prevailed too soon my heartless spirit failed when you were gone my limbs were stronger and oh how grievously i rue that afterwards a little longer my friends i did not follow you for strong and without pain i lay my friends when you were gone away my child they gave thee to another a woman who was not thy mother when from my arms my babe they took on me how strangely did he look through his whole body something ran a most strange something did i see as if he strove to be a man that he might pull the sledge for me and then he stretched his arms how wild oh mercy like a little child my joy my pride in two days more i must have died then do not weep and grieve for me i feel i must have died with thee o oh wind that o'er my head art flying the way my friends their course did bend i should not feel the pain of dying could i with thee a message send too soon my friends you went away for i had many things to say i'll follow you across the snow you travel heavily and slow in spite of all my weary pain i'll look upon your tents again my fire is dead and snowy white the water which beside it stood the wolf has come to me to-night he has stolen away my food for ever left alone am i then wherefore should i fear to die and my journey shall be shortly run i shall not see another sun I cannot lift my limbs to know if they have any life or no. My poor forsaken child, if I for once could have thee close to me, with happy heart I then would die, and my thoughts would happy be. I feel my body die away. I shall not see another day. End of the Complaint of a Forsaken Indian Woman Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter Twenty Two of Lyrical Ballads, seventeen ninety eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. The Convict. The glory of evening was spread through the west. On the slope of the mountain I stood, 
while the joy that precedes the calm season of rest rang loud through the meadow and wood and must we then part from a dwelling so fair in the pain of my spirit i said and with a deep sadness i turned to repair to the cell where the convict is laid the thick ribbed walls that o'ershadow the gate resound in the dungeons unfold i pause and at length through the glimmering grate that outcast of pity behold his black matted head on his shoulder is bent and deep is the sigh of his breath and with steadfast dejection his eyes are intent on the fetters that link him to death tis sorrow enough on that visage to gaze that body dismissed from his care yet my fancy has pierced to his heart and portrays more terrible images there his bones are consumed and his life-blood is drained with wishes surpassed to undo and his crime through the pains that o'erwhelm him still blackens and grows on his view when from the dark synod or blood-reeking field to his chamber the monarch is led all soothers of sense the soft virtue shall yield and quietness pillow his head but if grief self-consumed in oblivion would doze and conscience her torches appease mid tumult and uproar this man must repose in the comfortless vault of disease when his fetters at night have so pressed on his limbs that the weight can no longer be borne if while a half slumber his memory bedims the wretch on his pallet should turn while the jail mastiff howls at the dull clanking chain from the roots of his hair there shall start a thousand sharp punctures of cold sweat and pain and terror shall leap at his heart but now he half rises his deep sunken eye and the motion unsettles a tear the silence of sorrow it seems to supply and asks of me why i am here poor victim no idle intruder has stood with o'erweening complacence our state to compare but one whose first wish is the wish to be good is come as a brother thy sorrows to share at thy name though compassion her nature resign though in virtue's proud mouth thy report be a stain my care if the arm of the mighty were mine would plant thee where yet thou mightst bloom again end of the convict recording by verity kendall Chapter Twenty Three of Lyrical Ballads, Seventeen Ninety Eight, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Verity Kendall. Lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour, July Thirteenth, Seventeen Ninety Eight. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a sweet inland murmur. Footnote 4. The river is not affected by the tides a few miles above Tintern. End of footnote. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs, which on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion, and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here, under this dark sycamore, and view these plots of cottage ground, and these orchard tufts, which at this season, with their unripe fruits among the woods and copses, lose themselves, nor with their green and simple hue disturb the wild green landscape. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees, with some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Though absent long, these forms of beauty have not been to me, as is a landscape to a blind man's eye but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities i have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as may have had no trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love nor less i trust to them i may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime that blessed mood in which the burthen of the mystery in which the heavy and weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened that serene and blessed mood in which affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things if this be but a vain belief yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight 
when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fear of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart how oft in spirit have i turned to thee o sylvan why thou wanderest through the woods how often has my spirit turned to thee and now with gleams of half-extinguished thought with many recognitions dim and faint and somewhat of sad perplexity the picture of the mind revives again while i stand here not only with the sense of present pleasure but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years and so i dare to hope though changed no doubt from what i was when first i came among these hills when like a row i bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and lonely streams wherever nature led more like a man flying from something he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved for nature then the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by to me was all in all i cannot paint what then i was the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion the tall rock the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite a feeling and a love that had no need of remote charm by thoughts supplied or any interest unborrowed from the eye that time is past and all its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures not for this faint i nor mourn nor murmur other gifts have followed for such loss i would believe abundant recompense for i have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth but hearing oftentimes that still sad music of humanity not harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue and i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thought a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things all object of all thought and rolls through all things therefore am i still a lover of the meadows and the woods and the mountains and of all that we might behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear both what they half create footnote five this line has a close resemblance to an admirable line of young the exact expression of which i cannot recollect End of footnote. and what perceive well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse the guide the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being nor perchance if i were not thus taught should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay for thou art with me here upon the bank of this fair river thou my dearest friend my dear dear friend and in thy voice i catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes oh yet a little while may i behold in thee what i was once my dear dear sister and this prayer i make knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy for she can so inform the mind that is within us so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues rash judgments nor the sneers of selfish men nor greetings where no kindness is nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall ere prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings therefore let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee and in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms thy memory be a dwelling-place for all sweet sounds and harmonies oh then if solitude or fear or pain or grief shall be thy portion with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my excitations nor perchance if i shall be where i no more can hear thy voice nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together and that i so long a worshipper of nature hither came unwearied in that service rather say with warmer love oh with far deeper zeal of holier love nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings many years of absence these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake end of lines written a few miles above tintern abbey recording by verity kendall end of lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight by samuel taylor coleridge and William Wordsworth.